Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to today's seminar um, and welcome on Zoom as well. I think most of our participants, participants today are on Zoom. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dave Kershaw. I'm the Dean of the LSE Law School. Um, and today is our fourth event um, uh, addressing many of the issues that have come out of, of Ukraine. We've had an international law event, European Union and Ukraine event. Uh, last week we had one on financial sanctions, we have one today on uh, legal ethics um, and uh, the ethics of client selection. We have another one next week on international law and politics. Um, so today our seminar is on the ethics of Ukraine and the ethics of client selection and the limits of lawyering. Now, as you can see before I introduce uh, our esteemed panel, uh, we have a panel. Um, we are all men. We have tried very hard to have a panel of five members right, with two women, but this is a very controversial subject in, uh, in the world of lawyering in London and elsewhere. It's tough to get people to, 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 to come and sit on the panel. So I'm extremely grateful uh, to the three members of the panel uh, we have uh, uh, today. Uh, so uh, starting here from my right, we have uh, Trevor Clark. Uh, Trevor is a lecturer uh, in the legal profession at the University of Leeds and was formerly a uh, partner, a banking partner uh, at Linklaters. Um, next to Trevor, uh, we have Ian Miller, who is a partner at Kingsley Napoli, uh, who's one of the country's leading uh, regulatory lawyers. And next to Ian, we have Professor Richard Moorhead, who is a professor, professor of legal ethics at Exeter, and the inaugural, was until 2019, the inaugural professor of uh, uh, professional law and professional ethics at UCL. So we have three panelists, and this is how we're thinking of managing today's conversation. Uh, there are two big questions uh, I think we want to consider and debate. Uh, and so I'll start with the first question, and then the panelists will uh, give their thoughts on that question. Uh, before we then move to the second question, and then we'll open uh, open up uh, the conversation. So, the first question, gentlemen, on the on the ethics of client selection. So, there's a lot of media attention at the moment on uh, uh, media criticism of lawyers in relation to having taken on Russian clients in the first place. A sense that they took on these clients too readily, possibly a sense that they didn't do their know your client and money laundering checks effectively when they took them on. And, and then there's also a concern, perhaps less so in the media, but more amongst legal circles, that many of these lawyers who took on these clients have then just ditched them. Um, they have said, sorry, we can't act for you anymore, uh, even when those Russian clients are not on any sanctions list in the UK, the EU or the United States. And so I guess the starting question for me is, what's the problem? Why is it a problem at all to take on Russian clients? Um, I can't see why it would be a problem. Solicitors are allowed to choose their clients. And so long as they follow the regulatory procedures correctly, uh, there is no problem. So I guess my first question is, you know, what, what really is all the, the, the fuss all about in this regard. And maybe Trevor, I could start with you first. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, David. So I'm very pleased to be going first because I can uh, frame the issues in, in, in general terms and let the, the real experts uh, answer the, the difficult questions. I mean, for me, uh, I mean, I've seen this playing out uh, and there are some themes uh, emerging. So uh, you have the events um, uh, in Ukraine and then you have uh, sort of a moral outrage response and uh, statements about lawyers and enabling uh, lawyers, lefty lawyers, and that sort of thing in, well, not so much lefty lawyers, uh, but, but about lawyers in Parliament. Um, and then and then you have a, a sort of a, a, a response, a defence from the, from the profession, uh, from the Law Society and the City of Law Society, putting out statements. Um, and then, as you say, David, uh, notwithstanding that defence, uh, law firms are still pulling out of uh, out of Moscow um, and distancing themselves from, from Russian clients. Um, I mean, for me, I think the uh, trying to sort of think about what are the issues here. I think one, um, there's a question about are lawyers acting uh, illegally uh, or are they facilitating illegal conduct? And I think maybe that's where that KYC, the client onboarding issue, comes in. Maybe we'll come back to that. Um, and then, and then the other question is, are they, are they acting 
ethically or, or unethically. And then I think the issue breaks down into you know, that issue around client selection and then um, an issue around conduct. Um, I know the first question is around client selection. And we'll probably come back to, uh, to sort of conduct issues uh, in a moment. Um, I mean, on, on, the, on the client selection point, um, I should say as a, as a former partner of, of, of Linklater's, I, you know, Linklater's has been in the eye of the storm. I've like, been subject to some criticism, criticism in the past and everything I'm gonna say is, is, not, is, is, is based on publicly available information, not uh, anything that I gleaned from, from my career. But um, the first thing to say is I think uh, it's easy to be cynical and, 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 uh, and see law firms closing down their their, their, their Russian businesses as, as purely a business move. Um, um, and you know, the, 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 the Moscow offices of these, of, of the large firms, anyway, the international firms, Magic Circle, some of the big American firms, is relatively small as a proportion of the whole. So, Alan Overy, for example, um, did respond to an inquiry from the Times and, and they said that their, the Moscow business accounts for between 1% and 2% of their global revenues. And their global revenue is 177 um, uh, million or anyway, it was a relatively small, a relatively small proportion of their, of their of their global revenue. So, you know, given that uh, their Moscow business is worth 35 million, and one of the, you know, an individual bank client globally could be worth 15 to 20 million, it's not a difficult necessary business uh, decision. Having said that. Um, and, and they will be following their own clients. They'll be looking at, uh, at what the accountants are doing. They'll be following trends in the market. Um, you know, when JP Morgan, Citigroup, Goldman Sachs are pulling out of Russia, then um, uh, and they'll be they'll, they'll be you know they'll be looking at that, and and, and, and they'll be taking a lead. They'll be talking to their um, their um, their bank clients. Um, but but I think it's easy to be cynical. Um, I think there are you know there are um, the firms uh, particularly. The firms that I'm more familiar with are um, they are cognizant of um, sort of their wider uh, reputation and, and both from a business perspective, you know, they're, they're looking to protect their brand, but also you know they um, they know that their staff will will, will, will be um, very interested in the, the positions taken by by the firm, um, you know, and they're, they're thinking about recruitment, um, but also you know they they, they are moving towards um, uh, placing values more at the heart of what they do. And it's easy to be cynical about that, but they are taking definite steps in other areas, responding to the Me Too movement. Uh, well, firm's got a curfew now, you can't, uh, you can't take the team out for drinks after nine o'clock, and they're you know, putting measures in place. So uh, it's easy to be cynical. Uh, it's probably is primarily a, a, a business move, um, but, um, but uh, I, I think there are, you know, firms are, are, are moving towards um, wanting to be uh, putting sort of ethics more at the heart of their, of their strategy. On the, on the KYC uh, issue, um, I think maybe there's a divide between um, sort of pri the private, um, private client law firms uh, and other law firms. I think it, maybe it's more of a sort of private client uh, type issue. Um, I mean, Chatham House have done a report and, and uh, uh, you know, what, there were, there were some allegations in Parliament about firms not following proper KYC procedures, and uh, uh, so Bob Seeley, and it wasn't clear, it didn't provide any names. I think the SRA have written and asked, asked for more information. Um, but the, um, the Chatham House report did name um, some firms, and uh, you know, it's more, their view was it's more a private client sort of issue, but there, there are definitely uh, some, some allegations raised by Chatham House and others about. Uh, about uh, about that and what it mainly relates to is the requirement to um to when you're onboarding clients is to if, if they are politically connected people um under money laundering guidance and money laundering rules which the sra requires firms to follow um then you're required uh, if, if the client is connected is is a is, is a politician former politician or or is connected to a, a politician you're required to understand this enhanced due diligence and suggestion is um, and there have been some cases uh, on this where this has been brought before uh, the disciplinary, so this is disciplinary tribunal. The suggestion is that firms are not undertaking that enhanced due diligence, uh, just taking on clients uh, without uh, without identifying them versus connected. Uh, 
individuals. So I think that's more the private client. I don't think that sort of thing is happening at the, the, the bigger firms with, with the Moscow offices that are, that are, that are closing down. Um, but uh, there, there does seem to be some smoke out there uh, towards some fire as well as. Okay, so you will come back to a lot, of, a lot of the issues that you raised there, Trevor. Do you want to, do you want to comment there, Ian? Um, well, <clears throat> if I if I probably set out sort of how I, I sort of see this issue, and I um, when I I'm not going to say how long it was ago, but I, I was at the LSE, went off to to the world of of, of London lawyering, and and at, at that point um, the 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 prevailing view, and I think for quite a number of years afterwards, was that that just because a lawyer or solicitor or barrister acted for someone didn't mean they shared their views, they shared their values, they were there to to provide a service. Um, and there are obviously, and we'll certainly touch upon this, strong reasons why um, people need representation um, in in um, various aspects of law. Um, and I think the only limitations that, that existed were the law itself. So um, the criminal law, obviously the civil law, um, if you're doing litigation, the, the rules of um, the Supreme Court, those sort of things that that set out what you can and can't do in relation to, to your clients. But um, certainly if you had a conversation with somebody about this in the 1990s or the early 2000s probably, any lawyer would say, well, you know, my job is to represent people I don't share their values, that's, that's an entirely different issue. And I think, I think what's happened relatively recently, and I've not, I don't know whether Richard or Trevor have plotted this, but there's been a, a, a beginning or a growth of the thought that lawyers and their clients are not um, in separate spheres, that the clients that you have reflect upon the law firm, um, and therefore have an impact on the law firm. And, uh, and, and that was certainly becoming apparent in terms of acting for oil companies, um, gambling, cigarette manufacturers, et cetera, where there was quite a lot of misgivings expressed about, you know, why do you such and such a firm represent this particular thing? And I mean, there's a, there's a website in the States, I think, for, for law students that um, ranks law firms according to their, their sort of um, environmental um, record, which was obviously intended as as a, as a way of informing who you want to apply to. So, in a sense, the generation here, by and large, are are, are a driving force behind behind quite a lot of that that shift of views. And I I I see the the the, the Russia position and there's other aspects of it is as an extension and probably a more immediate and extreme example of that scenario where, uh, I mean, obviously what's happened in Ukraine is beyond um, description in terms of, of how hideous it is. The, the collective revulsion then rebounds upon law firms who then look at the, if they have Moscow officers, et cetera, they have a reputational issue, not just an ethical issue um, and, and not just a sanctions issue because um, sanctions obviously have a very specific effect on individuals, but other Russians are not sanctioned. Um, so it, it, is this just a continuation of that same process where there's a perception that there needs to be a greater alignment between the law firm and its clients and the values of both? And will, and, the, and the, I think certainly in relation to, to Russia, the, <coughs> the immediate quick and sort of hindsight version of what's happened is, is, is quite, sort of um, difficult to comprehend in a sense clients that the government would have four or five years ago been encouraging firms to take on and help integrate Russian into the sort of global economy. Um, and now it's, you know, why on earth are we erratic for them? Um, so it's a, it, to me, that's the fascinating issue is, the, is how do we deal with that going forward? Because it's not going to change and I think it's going to become the dominant view. How do law firms react to that in terms of client selection? And what gaps does that then create in terms of the rule of law and, and other aspects of, of, of frankly, transactional law um, that might have unintended consequences? So you know, what, what is the next Russia is um, because 
if, if lawyers are doing something now, or law firms are doing something now that in three years' time will be regarded as unacceptable, they've now got to start thinking about what that might be and planning um, rather than what's obviously happened in the space of three or four weeks. Um, so that's that was my... If we're going to reach just a quick couple of questions there again. I'm interested to know what you think about that development as well. So that's the development that we're seeing. And, and so what are, the, what are the implications of that for our conception of a democracy under the rule of law? And is, is it, should lawyers be pushing back upon that conception of the alignment, trying to treat lawyers as aligned with the values of their clients? Um, yes, in a sense, I, I think there's, in the area of litigation, there is a serious issue in a, in a common law system that depends upon an adversarial determination. If one party is unable to get representation because of, of the growth of this sort of um, um, approach. Uh, um, so how do we deal with that? Um, um, but even in the transactional world, if the, the whole point about being a lawyer is being independent of your client, saying to your client, you shouldn't really do this, or I don't think you should do it this way, you should do it that way. Um, but it, will we end up creating silos of different types of firms that act for certain types of clients? Um, because, and therefore, do we, we create a a law firm that, that is known for acting for certain types of clients and certain transactions. And that might not actually be good for all of us for that, for, for that salary to take place. So I think there are some serious issues that, that come from that development that I'm not sure anybody's begun to address. And, and the question of should, should lawyers push back? Yes, but I, I do, and the Law Society has certainly said this a few times in, in the last few weeks or months about the rule of law and the importance of representation. But, it doesn't feel like a message that's necessarily being treated with any degree of, um, you know, it's, people aren't on receive mode to that message. And abstract concept, concepts like the rule of law are a bit difficult to get across mm -hmm. to people in the street as to, it's really quite important that, that everybody is represented. Um, it seems quite distant. Okay. Thank you, I'm sure we'll have lots more questions on that when we come back. Richard, your thoughts? Yeah, I'll try to pick up that point of view in a minute. Uh, the, I mean, I think the basic the basic problem is there, there's a tension between two ideas, right? One idea is, and I just I looked up the UN's basic principles on the role of lawyers, and one of those principles says lawyers shall not be identified with their clients or their clients' causes as a result of discharging their function. And the kind of archetypal representation of that in this country is the cab rank rule, right? So the bar can very clearly say, we have to take clients if they can afford to pay for us, our services, uh, and therefore we're not identified with our clients. And there's that, that's the UN principle, if you like, written, written into the, the law in relation to the bar only. And the, the problem I think with that view is, is essentially a, a, the sort of the way the market has operated for a long time now is that's essentially a fairly hypocritical point of view for law firms generally to take because actually they do very when it suits them in their interest of their business generally very strongly identify with their interests of their clients so the students who've applied for trading contracts for instance will have had drummed into them by careers officers and the firms they talk to an interest in a need to be commercially aware, to be able to think like a business. And in many ways, that's a good thing and that's an innocent thing. But firms very much align, if you like, with the interests of um, business in a sort of general sense. The point about Russian clients and the issue now is, I suppose, the other, the other idea I wanted to raise, which is, is more strongly relevant to the second part of the discussion we're going to have today, but it comes from the Russia report, which I think was created about two years ago, it was a parliamentary select committee with high levels of security clearance investigating Russia. And it, the report has been partly released, it's heavily redacted. Uh, and that report, uh, based on sensitive security-based information, and that report very clearly identifies lawyers as a, a, a key constituency. They describe them as a key group of professional enablers, enabling um, the business of Russia, of furthering Russian state, Russian state interests 
through the representation of oligarchs and so on and so forth. Um, so that, that identifies, if you like, a national security concern, but a different kind of challenge to the rule of law. So lawyers and the law society like to talk about the rule of law as a right to representation, but a rule of law is actually much broader than simply a right to representation. Well, I guess my basic challenge to the law society or to David Panic or whoever is talking about the rule of law in those terms at any one moment is, show me the Russian oligarchs who can't get representation, who are barred from defending their cases, and then I might have some concern for that. But given the problems of the broader populace into access to justice and the rule of law more generally, I'm not very concerned about that constituency until I see a very specific problem. It might happen down the track, uh, uh, but I'm not worried about it yet. I, I suppose the, the way in which it might become a bit more interesting, and again, this might lead us into the second issue a bit more, is if we adopt rules or approaches to client selection or lawyers' tactics, which might inhibit groups which we have more sympathy for, which might properly need the benefit of uh, harder litigation tactics, for instance, to take an example. But again, I, need, I think we need to think that one, that one through. Um, the, my, my sort of basic objection to the rule of law representation linkage is not that it's not, it's not never true. Sometimes that issue is going to be true. And we have Article 6 protections, for instance, to deal with those kinds of pro problems. Sometimes it may be the case that a particular person genuinely cannot get representation. We should be worried about, about that problem. But the current rush away from Russian business probably won't lead there. I think it will probably lead to a kind of shake out in the kinds of firms that do this kind of work you'll have if you like smaller niche firms that will be willing to take on say criminal representation in relation to uh, russian uh, businessmen if they're pursued in relation to sanctions here or whatever it might be so i'm sort of not i'm just not very worried about that kind of access to justice rule of law type of point really the the other thing that i think it drives and you see this a bit in relation to the bar but it's the rule of law it's the right to representation for people who can afford the astonishing sums of money that it takes to instruct Firmex in relation to litigation in the High Court, right? That's basically what it largely means in that particular uh, concept. It's, a rule of, it's, the, it's a, an access to a certain kind of representation to a certain class of people, really. That's effectively what we're talking about there. And so I, I'm a bit sceptical of that as a, a really important consideration at this point in time. The more sort of general point I guess I want to make is that we as individuals, as social actors, forgetting about our, the, 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 uh, our role as lawyers just for a moment, we I think do have a moral responsibility to think about what contribution we make to the world through our work, our lives more generally, but through our work. So I think we should think about the kinds of clients that we want to work for, the kinds of work that we want to do. And we'll think differently about that we will, we will value different things in relation to that. But I also think it's perfectly valid for us to be criticised for those choices if those choices are questionable. Yeah. So I, I'm perfectly OK if a firm says we think it's really important for these reasons and perhaps for rule of law reasons that we represent this constituency. But I also think it's perfectly OK for them to be criticised for that. I don't think we should be trying to close down criticism by saying, well, actually, there's a rule of law question here. We shouldn't. We simply shouldn't be able to criticise lawyers for their choices. The only point to where I would have some sympathy with that argument is where that criticism might create acute access to justice problems or perhaps other acute so like safety type concerns. So, for instance, to take an example from a different area, immigration practitioners regularly singled, singled out for the representation of uh, fake asylum seekers, to use the politician's language, and some of those have been, you know, attacked, harassed, um, uh, uh, perhaps partly because of the political rhetoric that's directed in that direction. So we might sometimes need to think about those problems and perhaps representation in the courts is the point, although my view is the campaign rules perhaps too, too broad and too vague in some respects, but, but only at those points where there is genuinely a real challenge to rights representation in particular, should we be worried about those kinds of rules? The third, th can I make one more point? Definitely, I wonder if we could come back on, on that issue a little bit on that, that point. And then, should I come back now or should, do you want to maybe? Should I make the other point then? Because you won't forget your point, let's push me back. <laughs> yeah, I know, we know each other well. 
The, uh, so the, uh, I guess the third point is around uh, what's, what's, what's going on here, how incentivized, how well do lawyers think about the people that they take instructions from? Uh, now, I think there's, there's, there's it's a, I think in relation to some of the kind of the Russian um, oligarch, if you like, as an archetype, that can be really challenging. So if you read Catherine Dalton's book, so I've been busy reading that over the last week or two, she talks about oligarchs becoming essentially nominees of Putin through secret. They are written down, actually, interestingly, they sign a little contract with Putin. Uh, and this was part of the deal by which Russian assets uh, were either came to them in the first place or uh, so when they were awarded contracts for Russian businesses and so on, ownership of Russian businesses, or subsequently when Putin was threatening to prosecute these people. So somehow he brought a network, this is Dalton's point, I'm assuming it's correct, but I don't know, brought a network of people within his sphere of influence and they were sort of con contract, it's interesting that they were contracted in as well as just threatened, if you like, intimidated in. Um, it, it's going to be sometimes, it's going to be quite difficult for firms to know about that kind of thing, I guess. Um, but what I understand about the processes by which law firms do that kind of know your client kind of checking. I mean, in some ways, I, as, as I understand, I haven't done it myself, obviously I'm not a practitioner, it's quite sophisticated. They have sophisticated professionals doing this kind of work, but it's quite compliancy. It's quite tick boxy, you know, and it's a process which is driven by the economics of the law firm and the economics of the partner who wants to bring the client into the firm. They have very strong incentives, particularly the partner bringing the business in, to get that client over the threshold and into the firm. They drive most of the investigation and process around that. And the kind of the judgment, the, the value judgment, or the, the market sensitive, the, the, not the knowledgeable judgment about that particular client is perhaps a bit bureaucratic and removed from the people who might have something really to say about whether that should be a client of the, the firm or not. So there's, there is, if you like, a procedural judgment on the client, but there isn't necessarily a, a thorough substantive judgment on is this the kind of client we should take? That's right. Yeah, we're just picking up on that, Richard, and maybe bring Ian and Trevor in on that too. Is so there's a sense in which lawyers are taking on clients that maybe they shouldn't have done. And that sense is being driven by the fact that so many of these lawyers are now offloading them. And that brings us to the profit motive and the economics that Richard's just talked about in his final comment. So I, I'm wondering whether whether lawyers in this regard are behaving worse than they used to. And whether the reason they're behaving worse than they used to is because the economics of being a lawyer have changed so dramatically in the past 20 years. And so we can think about different components of that. One component part would be moving from a lockstep arrangement to an eat what you kill arrangement. Or connected to that, the fact that the, the, the person who brings in a client, the partner who brings in the client, may then take a, a share of the proceeds of that client for as long as that, that client is a client. So I'm wondering whether what we're seeing here at the moment is revealing that a shift in the economics of being a lawyer has actually driven uh, some more problematic behavior in taking on clients, following that tick box that Rich is describing, not actually doing your KYC, uh, 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 your money laundering checks as properly as maybe the lawyers would have done in the past. Um, under different economic arrangements and also perhaps under different uh, firm arrangements where lawyers used to be partners not firms in limited liability partnerships. Do we think there's anything in that? Bridge is nodding. <laughs> uh, well, I was about to say no. No. Um, and, and, and that's because in most large law firms, client onboarding and client acceptance is centralized. So you, it, it, the, the, the idea that a partner individually would take on clients and um, not undertake the appropriate procedures which are required by um, both the SRA and the money laundering regulations is 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 just just doesn't happen. So I don't think I don't well I don't think anything fundamentally has changed in that sense. I think what's changed is is the the wider point which we talked about of society's attitudes to whom lawyers act for and the criticism that they attract. Well, the greater criticism they now attract in terms of, of their clients that they might have previously, and I suppose a greater level of, of reputational um, awareness by law firms, um, the, you know, the rise of the legal press, um, probably greater interest in law firms in the mainstream press, etc. And 
and the fact that both the people that work within law firms, the people who might want to work within those law firms, um, and the people who are also clients of those law firms have a view. Mm -hmm. And and that's you know, that is what has changed, that that it's it all interrelates and causes a shift in what was the sort of paradigm of, of an individual or of a law firm 10, 15, 20 years ago. And, and the interesting thing, so just sorry, so hijacking the question and picking up what Richard said, is if that is right, and if we've now reached the stage that um, it, a, a law firm is can't just simply say, well, I've done all the money laundering checks, I've, I've done what I can in relation to why it's perfectly legal for me to act for this client and I'm therefore going to do it. Um, if that's not the test anymore, if the test is some much more unclear, higher threshold, then that, that's quite ill-defined. Different law firms will find different levels, which comes to my point about siloing. Um, but I doubt we'll reach the point where it will become a, a conduct rule or an ethical rule that says you shall never act for these types of clients, even though it's legal to do so. I think there will always be a, a more, it'll sit more in the reputational space rather than in the, the regulatory space. And that's, that's going to be quite complicated for, for, for law firms to navigate. Um, and, and obviously that means that their client bases might evolve in order to reflect that if they are more responsive than law firms. Um, and equally, there are um, you know, some law firms that will do that type of work. I mean, I think in fairness, criminal litigation and defending people is probably the paradigm rule of law points. So um, is the much more, um, you know, you're much more likely to get firms taking on people in that scenario. But in, in other transactional and discretionary litigation scenarios, that's, that's going to be quite a difficult thing to work through and decide where the line is for each individual law firm. Thank you. Yeah, I was wondering if I could just come in on that because I, I think I, I agree with uh, Ian. Um, I mean, certainly as I was um, sort of coming to the end of my career in practice, uh, the, the whole client onboarding process was becoming, you know, the traditional KYC plus and ethics committees uh, where you know other other issues were being started, were being brought into the decision uh, as to whether to act clients. And I think. Um, you, know, you, you could make an argument that the, the large firms who are pulling out of Moscow are doing what we would expect them to do if, 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 if they're you know, making the right call. They, you know, they did that for Russian clients at a time when um, you know, the UK government was encouraging Russian investment um, uh, in, and, and encouraging Russian companies to list on the London Stock Exchange. Uh, and, um, and, and now that political climate has changed. They've you know, they've reversed out of, uh, out of Russia and, and, and maybe that's what we're trying to do. And um, I think um, that, that, that difficult call that Ian was talking about um, as to, you know, do you judge the model, morals of your client? You know, what, what is the moral compass that you apply? Um, you know, reasonable people will disagree about, you know, what is moral in any, uh, any given situation. I think that is quite difficult. And, and whilst it's clear at the moment that you shouldn't have the Russians, it wasn't the Russian companies or... Um, it wasn't clear, um, you know, five, five, ten years ago, and I think the um, the firms have, have you know, the, the golden age of acting for Russian companies for the Magic Circle, for example, I think came to an end in two thousand and fourteen. They started actually started dropping up in two thousand eight, um, and, and firms started to a little bit from Russian business, but definitely in two thousand and fourteen when the first serious sanctions were were introduced. So, um, um, you know, this is this is sort of now. Um, now the end of that process, if you like, but uh, I think it's a very difficult call, um, and um, you know that that sort of judging about whether you should have for tobacco companies or uh, or for um, uh, for you know companies that, that present an environmental risk. That those are really challenging. You know, can be very challenging um, um, questions around the margins. So um, uh, I think I think it's you know perhaps, perhaps the. the Firms have done the right thing. In terms of the, the question, you, the, the other question you ask about, you know, is this um, representative of, of a general trend towards firms becoming more corporate and more, you know, um, financially focused? Um, you know, that, that is definitely there is has been a, a trend for firms to become more managed um, and, uh, and, and and be managed um, 
along you know, corporate lines to sort of maximize immediate profit, almost like companies, um, kind of financialized companies will, you know, that's true strategy will be short-term geared towards paying a dividend to the clients here at Norton Law Firms being criticised for moving to that sort of model where um, you know, they, they, the, the strategy is, is, is designed to, to generate as much profit that we distributed to partners. So there, there is, there is, a, there is a, a question there um, and the legal press is now publishing um, the profitability of firms, so partners of firms that can now see how much um, partners and other firms are running and it does create that competitive pressure. <coughs> Attention. So there is a whole different issue around incentives, um, and you talked about uh, you know, lockstep um, being replaced more by a sort of eat what you kill sort of model, where uh, instead of all, all partners earning the same, depending on how many years of service they've had at the firm, compared to now being remunerated based on uh, what they're personally generating in terms of profit, and that, that those incentives are are an important part of this this debate. Uh, I think. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, just to pick up, so to pick up on Ian's pushback a little bit. So I think the, it's important to understand the, the, the importance of the financial incentives is not binary, but it is it is important. It is influential. It is a, a factor in decision making. So uh, so the point I was making about introducing partners in relation to know your client, it's not that they would be able to, if you like, fix the process, but they are very influential. They are driving parts of the process. And they are typically rainmakers in firms, so they are, if you like, politically influential within the firm. So they have that kind of sociological influence because of their economic power. The point that Trevor made at the end there is really important. Firms are now much more financially focused, and they're much more unstable because of that financial focus. So partners know that they can get de-equitized, they can get leveraged out of firms, or laterals can come in, uh, and, and there's much more fluidity around move, movement between between firms and has occasionally led to the collapse of even quite big firms, particularly in the States. And that drives a heavier appetite for risk. It puts more emphasis on making money and a stronger appetite to take some risk with reputation or regulatory obligations or, or, or whatever it might be. And at the moment, what we're seeing is if you like the reverse of that, people taking a step back and saying, reputationally, this is way too hot to handle. We have to step back from this market. But the basic financial drivers push them towards thinking about things in financial terms rather than thinking about thinking so strongly about regulatory concerns or reputational concerns or ethical concerns, still less any kind of moral concern. Yeah. So it's a, it's a pressure rather than a switch. Right. And the pressure that in your view generates a, a, an appetite for risk, but an appetite for risk in the short term as well, right? So Sometimes. If, if you're generating your revenue within a short period of time than you were previously, then maybe you're happy to take those reputational risks, yeah. um, which may which may impact over a longer period of time once you've left the firm, for example. Okay, so, so sorry, I was just going to say that there are also things back back in. Yeah, there are, going, <laughs> there are things pushing the other direction. So, for example, in fact, relevant to, to here, the, the, the need to attract talent and to keep things and, and to, to be a firm that people want to work for. Yeah. And which is essential to, to all of those financial drivers. Yeah. Pushes in the other direction. So, so if you are not the firm that people would like to come and work for, and as we've probably found the last two years, stay working for, um, because there's been quite a lot of people who've, who've, who've left the profession in the last couple of years, mm -hmm. then you are not going to survive as a business in any event. So, so you can't, in a sense, the idea that it's all driving one way is, is, is not right in the sense that there's a lot of very strong reasons why law firms are going to have to adapt to you, you, your, your cynical look on your face, Richard, but, but I, think, <laughs> I think there are quite a lot of reasons why law firms are going to adapt. No, I think, I think that's coming a bit. And I, so roll on Friday, so the law students, I encourage you to go away and read roll on Friday. It's fascinating and it's funny. Mm -hmm. uh, and they get some really good stories about what goes on in, in law firms. They did, they did recently did a good culture I don't remember where Kingston Jack came We weren't in the list. Oh, okay. We weren't part of the population. You weren't that in that group. Subject. No. Okay. Uh, and that's really, that's really interesting. And, and, and uh, it's, it's more, I think, about culture and quality of working environment than about that kind of ethicality. But I think that might come. So if there, is big, if there are big differences between um, Magic Circle Firm X and Magic Circle Firm Y, so Magic Circle Firm Y won't touch petrochemicals or arms dealers or tobacco. And like, you, you could imagine that might start to make a difference to recruitment patterns. But at the moment, there is no distinction between firms on that basis. But certainly in the popular 
your student recruitment consciousness, I don't think. I mean, I'd be very happy to be corrected. There was a bit more of that consciousness around working culture just starting to come. It's a really recent, it's a really recent phenomenon. Um, so I think it will, uh, those pressures, will, and I'm not certainly not saying the financial pressures are the only thing that's important. And there's a, 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 a one reason for that is to take it in a slightly different direction. People tell me, and I don't know if this is true or not, I'd be really interested to know from people who do know more about this than me, that it's very different in the States than in the UK. So the people keep telling me US firms are nowhere near as bad at this as UK firms are. Uh, but you, you, US firms are more financialized than UK firms, right? So it's, if that's right, so I don't know if it is right, the US firms are better than UK better, better than UK firms. That would suggest it's not purely financial things that are right. And they certainly haven't got better cultures, right? American firms are like, oof, like really very tough environments, uh, particularly in the States. So, I, you know, it, it is more complicated than the money. But I think the money is a big driver of this kind of thing. But also if the, if the money is a driver of the problem and the response to that, Ian, which sounds fair to me, which is that almost all firms have no choice if they want to recruit and they want to survive. If, if that's the case, then what you have is a, an industrial externality in which law firm behavior is generating a problem. But if that's the case, the answer to any externality is to regulate it. And it's for the SRA then to more firmly address the incentive structures to which law firms uh, are subject, whether that be income distribution or whether that be uh, more deep structure incentives associated with uh, the, the organizational structure of a law firm. So I think then that, that, that's the logic of that response, I think. I, I, it, it may be, although you're getting certainly the SRA into an area of regulation that they've, they've not traditionally been in, but, but the SRA has started quite recently doing, doing a lot of work around law firm culture um, and, and the internal relations within law firms that, that again, 10 years ago, um, most lawyers when asked would say, well, that's not to do with them. They regulate our relationships with clients. Um, so there is, there is a sort of a, a shift within the regulation mm -hmm. towards that. I think whether it would go so far as to regulate the way in which profits are distributed within all firms, I, I suspect not, but equally, I think there are other drivers in the market around new providers and, and other aspects of, of the introduction of ABS that might slowly change those, those financial models. Okay. okay. So wonderful conversation. I mean, I want to sort of shift us to the second part of, the, of, of, of today's debate, and then we'll have about half an hour when uh, everyone can ask questions. So uh, for, for the folks on Zoom, and most of you are on Zoom, uh, if you have any questions, we can take those questions by raised hand, or you can write something into the chat and we can pick that up uh, and, and I can uh, convey the question to, to the panel. Um, so please start writing in any questions that you might have. Um, so, uh, you know, as part of this media storm around lawyers right now, there's a second component of that. And that second component seems to be associated with an idea that lawyers are going too far, um, that lawyers are enabling poor activity. Um, uh, they are um, just, just simply going too far in their pursuit of their clients' interests. Uh, and perhaps the most obvious example is around, I think, what they're called slaps, in which law firms are, are acting in a way to silence people is the claim by generating huge amount of fees that, 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 that um, um, are just um, so frightening. Uh, the, 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 the person who is targeted stops their behavior, stops speaking in a particular way. But there are other examples. So, but I guess the response to this is, well, again, aren't we losing sight, to go to what Ian's uh, uh, earlier point, aren't we losing sight of the role of lawyers? Lawyers are gatekeepers of the rule of law, and everyone is entitled to have their rights protected and enforced. And that's what lawyers do. They pursue the interests of their clients, Richard, uh, to ensure that their rights are enforced. So, uh, I, again, so I'm interested in your, in your thoughts on this, and maybe we'll go in the reverse direction of the panel this time. We'll start with Richard, uh, then to Ian, and, and then to Trevor. Yeah, so um, Trevor and Ian know uh, that I sort of collect examples of lawyers going too far. <laughs> so I have quite a lot, and I write a blog about it, it's called Lawyer Watch. So I pick out uh, uh, these examples and write about them. I've been doing a lot of work at the moment on uh, the post office scandal, where you see lawyers going too far at half a dozen, a dozen different points in time across 20 years from different organizations and firms and, and uh, in, in ways which led to people experiencing really horrible miscarriages of justice. So this is not a problem that is confined to certain kinds of firm acting for 
um, so emotional oligarchs. You know, I think there is a, a general question about whether lawyers understand some of the constraints that do exist on their behaviour and some of the constraints, and some of which are quite clear in the brief, and some constraints which are, if you like, a bit more discretionary or vague or harder to be absolutely certain about, which perhaps uh, are harder to regulate for in terms of bright line rules, but should it be impacting on their uh, conduct? Um, I, I was wondering about going through, through, let me just try and list some of those examples sure. so the students and the, the audience got a bit of a sense of the kinds of things that they're talking about. So the current one is slap suits, and that's using threats of usually defamation proceedings, uh, suggesting that um, allegations are untrue and defamatory and or malicious, uh, usually, uh, to silence investigative journalists, to prevent the production of books, sometimes to, pre pre to prevent the vetting of uh, people trying to seek positions of influence, uh, uh, and, uh, and that deploys defamation, as I mentioned, but sometimes things like data protection, using legal proceedings essentially for ancillary purposes. The legal proceedings aren't really being used for, to advance the legal right, they're being used to intimidate somebody, or to threaten somebody, or to smear uh, somebody. Um, so there's that kind of there's that kind of problem. There's sort of scorched earth litigation, uh, deploying vast resources to again to intimidate or prevent people bringing their claims or to prevent them defending their claims. There are, if you look at commercial litigation cases very regularly, I would say maybe I just see a slightly uh, a particular sample, but quite frequently high court judges criticising. Uh, commercial law firms for their litigation behavior tactics. Uh, the, the kind of most famous example is actually a Russian case, Abramovich and Baranovsky, where one of the team of solicitors, I think it was Baranovsky's lawyers, but I'm not entirely sure, was criticized for polishing evidence, for instance, uh, the uh, massaging the story uh, to present it in the best light, if you like. And that kind of polishing evidence thing, you see that all the time in, in commercial litigation cases, cropping up as something which the high court judges wring their hands off and wag their finger and maybe award indemnity costs against the lawyers. And it doesn't generally go a great deal further than that. Um, there is the suggestion made by parliamentarians of coordination with Secure private security firms or oppressive regimes. Uh, so, um, for instance, um, well, I mean, I don't, maybe I don't want to get too much into specific examples, but the idea that law firms work alongside with, in coordination with uh, security firms, garnering evidence by illegal means, perhaps applying intimidatory tactics outside of litigation whilst the lawyers apply pressure through litigation. And a sense, I don't think evidence on the whole, so there are some cases where you can see a bit of evidence. Um, I could point people towards those cases if they're interested of more explicit coordination. Um, the uh, using silence, uh, silencing techniques, trying to settle cases, uh, to uh, to uh, prevent cases being brought in a particular way. I will talk about this one case because I think it's sort of interesting. I won't mention the individuals. Um, don't want to get sued for defamation. Uh, but uh, it's a quite well-known case, Magic Circle for uh, Firm defending a, uh, a, um, uh, a uh, not, not I think a Russian oligarch, but a, 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 a business uh, person accused of... Um, I think it was bribery, I can't quite remember now, something like that. It was a big, big, big trial. On the eve of the trial, um, witnesses who were due to give evidence for the prosecution indicated that they'd been pressured to change their evidence by the defence. And what had happened was the lawyers for the defendant and the defendant had met with some of the witnesses in breach of the defendant's bail conditions, as it happens, and sought to compromise civil cases that they were involved with, with those witnesses. And during those settlement discussions, the witnesses said, and we don't know if this is true or not, but the witnesses said that the lawyers for the defendant had told the witnesses what they should be saying at the criminal trial. Okay? This is all reported in the Financial Times. The judge, as you might imagine, went ballistic. Uh, the trial was prevented, was adjourned from going ahead. 
and he uh, called for a hearing whereby the two partners in the firm had to be brought back before him and uh, asked to show cause as to why they shouldn't be committed for contempt. And they instructed a leader QC to talk the judge out of referring them for, for uh, contempt. Uh, and the, uh, their defence was essentially uh, was, we're not actually criminal defence lawyers, we don't really know what we're doing. Okay, so that was their, their defence, just so you know what it was. Uh, the trial was adjourned. It was due to happen again, I think, six months or nine months later. And lo and behold, uh, and the, that firm ceased acting. So we can assume they didn't have anything further to do with it. Lo and behold, the trial doesn't go ahead because some of the witnesses don't want to give evidence for the defence. Okay, So you have very serious uh, evidence, only evidence, of uh, attempts to uh, interfere with the evidence of witnesses. And that trial doesn't actually go ahead. So that's, if you like, uh, and I, I suppose what the lawyers would say they were doing, I'm assuming they would deny saying and, uh, what the witnesses said they said, is we were just trying to settle the cases and do our best for our clients. We were trying to protect their rights in your terms, but actually that had very serious implications for the conduct of the, or appear to have very serious implications for the conduct of the trial. You see, that's a very extreme, unusual example, but those kinds of at the margins conduct, which is either clearly uh, 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 inappropriate or questionable. The use of non-disclosure agreements to silence victims of misconduct with very wide, term, you know, all sorts of different tactics like that, which have a significant impact on, uh, on uh, one side in the dispute or a particular constituency. Uh, 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 the more general, so a whole raft of behaviours which are questionable or, or prohibited in professional ethics terms, relatively rarely scrutinised or enforced. I mean, I think the SRA uh, is uh, more interested in this sort of thing now, is more willing to investigate this sort of thing than it was. Just to hear what Ian, Ian, Ian knows this back from me. Uh, but still quite hesitant to deal with it because they're very expensive, difficult cases to bring because they usually be vigorously defended, as you might imagine. The other problem with the kind of, they're just defending their clients' rights is it's all one side, right? It's all one side at this defence of rights is all about the defense of the interests of powerful individuals. Everybody outside of that group is often without representation or struggling on much more minimal representation. So there's a complete imbalance and both those inappropriate tactics and that imbalance compromises the rule of law much more than a concern to ensure that rich people get representation from the best, in quotes, lawyers. That would be my basic. Thank you, Richard. Yeah. Um, well, this is another, to me, interesting area of, of which is a long claim. Um, so it used to be that, that doing, acting in your client's best interest and vigorously defending your client's best interest, as long as it was legal, was, was regarded as fine. I mean, obviously, there were court rules relating to, to um, behaviour before a court and administration of justice and indeed ethics rules. Um, and what has developed in the last few years is a bit more emphasis on the, the third limb of legal ethics. I say this with some trepidation given now I'm sitting between, but in, in that if you break the legal ethics down to its sort of essentials, it's the administration of justice acting in the client's best interest and also serving the public interest. And, and that serving the public interest was pretty much ignored. Um, not least because it's the least easy to, to understand and what it means. Um, and this came up most prominently, um, certainly in my mind, with the debate around MDA. Yeah. Because um, <clears throat> for those of you who have not come across, many of you probably have the MDA debate. So the issue that arose immediately following the Me Too movement was the use of MDAs to, to effectively silence the victims of. of of sexual misconduct, um, who brought employment claims, um, and so the uh, and there was certainly one notable case um, which involved um, you know, quite onerous terms beyond what one would normally expect to see in, in that type of agreement, but that effectively prevented lots of things that you would expect a reasonable thing like you know, the ability to go and take medical advice or or, or or speak to a therapist about what's happened those sort of things. So um, the, the SRE issued a, a warning notice shortly after these subcases came to the public, into the public, mostly through the FT as well. Um, and um, 
And what they effectively said is just because you can, that doesn't mean that, that you should. And that we, we would certainly regard certain of these terms in, a, in an NDA as being unacceptable and will enforce against them. Terms which probably are enforceable in contractual terms before a court. But the SRA said, no, we're, we, we would take action if we came across these being used, particularly in employment um, cases. So you've got the beginning of that growth of because you know, the justification of that is because it's not in the public interest for lawyers to be doing that. There's a, there's a wider public interest in, in ensuring that, that um, in that case, sexual misconduct, but other behaviours are not covered up. Um, and, and I think that has grown a bit. I noticed the SRA's latest guidance in relation to violence and duties in litigation and slaps again comes back to the sort of we would expect lawyers to act in the public interest or solicitors to act in the public interest and and so that area is very ill-defined um shares in common with our earlier discussion as to you know what does it mean particularly when you do have duties to act in your client's best interest um but nonetheless it clearly exists and it probably is growing and i suspect quite a lot of the shift in societal values will mean that in other areas and arguably in relation to the invasion of Ukraine and all sorts of other things, what's acceptable in the public interest will grow and develop in that space. But it is ill-defined. We don't know exactly what it means, but I suspect um, some of the things that have gone on in the past will no longer be acceptable and probably will be subject to SRA enforcement. Um, I would add the, the law in the place in relation to SLAPS, which is this, the underlying law um, uh, as I think the government has said, needs changing as well. It's not. Mm -hmm. it, it is not just the law is having made up this law. It, it, it's it's the existing law. The most of defamation, I think, has flaws that probably need addressing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, mean, I was going to say the the legal ethics literature. Um, uh, you know, it's basically a debate between those who push this sort of view of lawyers as as. Uh, neutral, uh, you know, unaccountable, um, you know, often called the standard conception of, 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 of the lawyer's role. Um, yeah, it, it's, it suggests that everything is okay, you know, any, any conduct of lawyers is okay if it's undertaking, undertaken in the interest you know, of their client and providing it, 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 it doesn't overstep a legal line, it's not illegal or facilitating illegal behavior. Uh, or um, isn't a breach of you know, the professional code of conduct that the lawyer is is a party to. So that sort of you can see some of that coming through in the commentary and some of the responses from professional bodies. Uh, and actually, the government is now looking at closing some of those um, issues in, in relation to litigation and slaps. And you know, so that that's sort of the government is responding to that. But then I think as Ian in in and, and Rich was saying, basically there, there is an argument that, that that lawyers shouldn't be doing it anyway. You know, and that that comes to issues around integrity um you know, what what standard of behavior do we do we expect lawyers to subscribe to or adhere to um uh, and so you know moving to the other end of the spectrum you know, there are those that, that argue about these things that will push a view of lawyers as, as having to be moral activists you know and, and that with integrity and you know if if your conduct is something that uh, people generally would consider was unethical or immoral then as a lawyer you shouldn't do it because lawyers are expected to adhere to higher standards of behaviour. That, that's, the, that's the argument. And the reason we expect lawyers to do that uh, is uh, not least because um, it undermines the legitimacy of the legal profession and lawyers. Um, you know, there are all sorts of business reasons as well, reputation and recruitment and all the things we've talked about. But fundamentally, you know, it will undermine uh, the legitimacy of the legal profession, also undermine public trust. There's all sorts of arguments why uh, we would might expect lawyers to, to act with integrity. Um, Rich has given some examples of, of, of where that has been an issue in litigation and, 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 um, and he also talks about these slap cases. It's not just in litigation, that's where these cases tend to, to, to get a public airing, um, and, but, but in the transactional uh, arena as well. Most corporate lawyers are working in the transactional arena. Um, uh, there are more transactional lawyers than there are uh, litigation lawyers and some of these sort of trends you know, this sort of issues around integrity that we see with these slap cases you can see in the transactional context as well and it comes down to where um, lawyers are pushing 
the boundaries for their clients and often exploiting inequalities in resources between two sets of clients. But I'm doing some research at the moment on lawyers in a particular area of finance practice, where you know, one, one side of these transactions that the clients have so much more power, you know, the banks on one side and private equity firms on the other. Um, and, um, and you see that affecting lawyer behavior. Um, and you see some quite uh, um, you know, all, all aggressive tactics and, and, and things that you, you might question from, a, a, from an integrity perspective. And there's been lots written on you know, the role of lawyers in you know, should they be um, have fidelity to the law uh, or is, is the role of the transaction lawyer to help their clients structure around the law? You know, and if the, you know, the, 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 the spirit of the law as well as the, the literal interpretation of the law and, and, and lawyers and corporate lawyers in particular have been criticised for, um, for helping uh, their clients structure around the law. So there's a big debate on the transactional side as well about, um, about the ethics of, of, of lawyers' conduct. And I, I sort of have, if we think about these issues around Russia as being um, firstly a question about client selection and then around conduct, um, I think the issues around conduct are clearer. I think uh, in, in terms of what we might expect lawyers to do. Um, right. Like, like, um, Clear in the sense that they've gone too far. Yeah. Yeah. Many, many questions that I have, but enough of my questions. Um, so I just want to open it up to, to, to the audience, um, see if you have any questions about the two core areas that we've been discussing. Um, so we'll start with the, the, uh, the in-person and then I'll have a look online as well. Um, I have quite a granular question, but I think it's a nice segue into a bigger question about the extent to which lawyers sometimes turn a blind eye to things. So my granular question is that to the extent that big law firms are now affording Russian clients, um, not those on sanctions lists, of course, but others, and they're doing that mid retainer, so in the course of acting for them, they will need a good reason for doing that. I suspect their good reason will be um, based in money laundering. They now um, suspect that perhaps their successful Russian, Russian business money is funding an illegal war. That suggests to me that they might have to make a POC related report to the NCA if they're going to offboard that client. Um, do you think the authorities will be interested to know why? if they've happily acted for these clients for the last 10 years, they felt able to do so without making poker reports. After all, Crimea was the next eight years ago. I beg you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, it, it, I'm gonna cop out slightly by saying it's very fact sensitive in that I can see circumstances where you would, a, a firm might off board it's a great new words added to the English language in the last three weeks. Um, <laughs> onboarding as opposed to onboarding a client. Um, <clears throat> and where most contractual terms of law firms would permit you to do it, but you're then back into the acting of client's best interests. Um, and you know, just because we can, should we questions about this? And I, I, th I think you're right, there is a there is a risk that you, if you're if you're founding your decision in AML, um, an AML decision, then that is going to be problematic. There may be other reasons. Um, there might be, for example, insurance reasons or something else that sits behind the law firm where they are no longer going to be covered for that type of activity and therefore can't do it anymore. Or the risks have shifted to an extent where um, they they can't do it anymore. So I, I think if I was Involved in that process, I'd be looking for other than AML reasons, if I can put it that way. But yes, you're right that we, we could end up in a situation of poker five years down the line, um, or whatever it might be, and, and it's trying to explain why now and not then. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I was just going to say that, um, just in, in terms of what law firms have announced, um, you know. Don't think anyone's actually closed their office yet in Moscow. They've announced that they're winding down their businesses and will close their offices and, and are reviewing their businesses and exiting. Um, so whether they're actually withdrawing from individual mass, I don't know. They may, they may well be. Um, but I, I suspect that's a very live discussion that's going on at the moment. 
um, as to whether they're actually withdrawn from particular retainers. Obviously, if a client is sanctioned, that's an easy decision, but, but not so easy if, if not. Um, what, um, what law firms might be doing is thinking of spinning off their offices. So some firms did that already with their Eastern European offices, they just did that um, for, for business, business reasons. Um, and whether, whether that would allow them to, to carry on, I don't know how quickly they'd be able to do that and whether that would allow them to keep, uh, keep, um, keep working. But I suspect a number of firms are looking at what to do with their Moscow businesses and it might be the part of those offices basically form, form, new, form new firms uh, and separate off. Yeah, this might be a really silly and high thing to say, um, Sarah, you might, um, you might want to come back, but the, um, it, might be, I, 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 it might be a really great opportunity, actually. I, I, I wouldn't think the, the, the regulator, the NCA, would be that interested in going after the firms. I think I'd just say, we learn from experience, let's move on. Um, I suspect, unless they see something really horrendous, in which case it probably, the information probably won't come from reports, reports from those firms. Um, but it might present a bit of an opportunity to learn from the experience. What's different now that was different then? Why, how would things be done differently? You would like to think that somebody might think about collecting and thinking about that information. Um, that might be a rather optimistic hope, but that, it does present quite an interesting learning opportunity, both for the firms and the regulators, about, about how, why this has gone so badly wrong. If you have That's all I wanted to say about that. Thank you, Richard. I'll bring you in a minute. I just want to bring someone in from, from, uh, from Zoom. Um, so we have a question here about, um, uh, about we have a bunch of really great questions here on, on Zoom as well. Um, I would be interested to know the panel's views, um, um, particularly Richard, so, you, so we'll have the whole panel's views, but about the cab rank rule for the bar and whether it's still fit for purpose. Some of us at the bar feel strongly that we should, should, we should be entitled not to take on certain clients, particularly in the Russian sanction sphere and that this should not be regarded as professional misconduct. What is the principal distinction between solicitors and barristers? If solicitors de can, can climb, decline to act or cease to act, why shouldn't barristers be able to do the same? If you go first, then we'll bring in. Yeah, bring in so uh, the, I, I feel sort of, I, I actually, the cab rank rule is one of those issues that I feel really torn about. Um, because the, the rule is largely symbolic, it's largely used for symbolic purposes. I think probably the bar would be well advised to go away and think quite carefully about where do they really need it and want it, what sorts of circumstances. It is terribly useful for the bar to be able to say, we have to take clients on, but I suspect actually often, and I'm certainly told by people working in in, uh, in, in certain sections of the bar that, you know, it's more honoured in the breach than in the observance. Um, you can't get anybody to say that publicly. So if anybody on Twitter, <laughs> any of the barristers on Twitter are watching this, they'll be going, I'll, I'll be getting beaten up on Twitter later on about this, or whether if I see any of them. The, um, but I suspect there is, there, there is a bit of a need for a rethink, because what, what you really want is to, to ensure that people who need representation, who can't get representation, can get representation. But a lot of the other, uh, 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 other situations, there isn't really. I mean, is, is there really a need for the commercial bar to have the cab rack rule? I'm, I'm not terribly convinced by myself, actually. Uh, the, if you look at um, the Diana Rose um, controversy, di, di, uh, I won't go into the details too much, but it was about Diana rep representing a Caribbean country in relation to a constitutional case at the Privy Council. If I remember rightly, I don't think the Privy Council, the cab rack rule actually applied. Uh, Diana Rose did a brilliant job of defending her position as to why she took the case on a kind of rule of law basis uh, and, and defended her position and was subject to criticism. And I sort of think that's generally how it should be. They should be lawyers are principal people and able to stand up for those principles and should generally be able to say, well, this is why I'm taking the case and, and, and argue their corner rather than just be able to say always, well, there's a rule. I'm not convinced that there always needs to be a rule. So I think it needs a bit of a look, but I'm not quite sure how far I'd go in terms of reorganising it. Thank you. Do you have any further thoughts there? I, I, mean, I mean, the cab rank rule is central to the ethos of the bar. It, it, um, the bar as a group is, is fascinating in its, in its own way, but, but you know, the cab rank rule sits at the centre of it, as in, we will act for everybody, anybody that comes. But equally, my experience, so we can share the Twitter experience as well, is 
there are a lot of exceptions to the cap rank rule in the BSB's rules. And also, um, you know, I, I certainly would never instruct a barrister who didn't want to do the case. So, um, and they would make it pretty clear they weren't very happy, you know, whether we, you never get to the point of saying, I demand you do this thing and invoke the cap rank rule. So the reality is, it's there to protect and justify the bar for doing unattractive cases. But that probably is a good thing. So I'm, I'm like Richard, a bit torn about, I, I think it's a good thing in a funny way. I, I always think solicitors, certainly doing litigation and criminal defense should have a similar rule and then they operate on the same basis. Um, so in relation to the question, it's a good thing because here you might be finding Russian clients who are struggling to find representation and the, and the, and the cab rank rule ensures that they get them when some barristers would actually prefer not to act for them. And be there is a good thing in, in, in your view. It, yes, I mean, I think it, it maybe makes the representational pool bigger for those clients, if I can put it that way, but, but equally, if a particular barrister doesn't want to take the matter on, I think, I don't think the cab rank rule is going to be the trump card. Um, yeah, I was just going to add that, um, yeah, I, I sort of agree the my, my uh, understanding, it, it, uh, it's more observed in the breach and it, and it is a, it does help barristers in some sense. I, I had a look at the, on the standard text, student text on legal ethics um, so a couple of days ago in preparation for this, and there's a section on, on the cap rank rule and two things um, jumped out at me. One was a quote from Jeffrey Robertson QC that's reproduced in this, in this textbook, which is, the cab rack rule, you know, it work, works to, you know, to reduce the amount of excrement barristers get through their letterbox sort of thing. It's sort of a, you know, that can be quite sort of protective. The other thing was it just, there was a lot on the cab rack rule, but very little on solicitors. And, and, uh, and, what they, and the question I think was about, well, what is the difference between barristers and solicitors? And I think the basic position is, you know, solicitors don't have an equivalent of the cab rack rule, but there, but there is, it, it's very, the code is silent, isn't it, Richard, on the, on the specifics here? And uh, the old code of conduct uh, used to be clear that you, um, there was no, um, you know, there was no issue, issue around sort of declining instructions for the client, provided you weren't discriminatory, and discriminatory in a sort of a, um, uh, you know, around race and, and, and gender and, and that sort of thing. Um, but that's, that's gone now, hasn't there? And there's a sort of a general reference to. You must not discriminate when acting for clients. There's nothing about client selection now in the code. Yeah, I think he's right. I think that Ian might remember that. Yeah. That is right. It, it is right. But equally, I feel if a client comes along who who is uh, you know, within my specialism, can pay to put it brutally. Um, I, you know, I start with the presumption of acting rather than the presumption of not acting. Or yeah. Yeah. Because I. I provide a service. No, and I think that's a, that's a defensible position. I think that's a position that, you know, is, it's better to, that there isn't a need for the rule. You would do that without the rule. I think if that changes, and there may be particular circumstances, I don't think solicitors need the cap rack rule. I think probably the bar doesn't really need the cap rack rule either, if we really boiled it down, except maybe in truly exceptional circumstances. The bar would be queuing up for controversial cases usually, uh, for all sorts of reasons. Um, so I think in broad terms, it, it, it performs sometimes a symbolic purpose. It is, it, I mean, it, it is the third rail, which is one of the reasons why I tread that. I'm not, not entirely joking about the point of view, the point, the point on Twitter. It, it, it sends them into apoplexy if you suggest it isn't really a rule which is firmly adhered to. But I'm sure we've all had examples, and I wasn't in practice very long, but I had examples from my time in practice and have heard uh, many stories um, since it's a bit, it's a symbolically useful protection, com makes things more comfortable. But I think maybe a little bit of discomfort could be quite useful to for, uh, to, to make people think about what they what they do and why, mm -hmm. yeah. except in exceptional circumstances like criminal defence. Thank you, gentleman at the back. Uh, thank you. Um, the UK's national security strategy and economic crime strategy and anti-corruption strategy all refer to lawyers acting as professional enablers of corruption and kleptocracy. Um, by and large, the legal profession is pushed back against both the label and the concept. And I wonder whether the panel thinks the UK has a problem of lawyers acting as professional enablers. Um, I do, as you might guess from what I've said. Uh, what I'm not so sure about is whether it's a problem with the profession or it's a problem with the legal system. 
because obviously parts of the problems are the, the way our court system works, the way our cost rule works, and the uh, particular rules around things like defamation and so on and so forth. Um, but I certainly think that law firms push things too far. I think the enabling point is sometimes about kind of are they doing the right thing kind of points, but it's also sometimes about lawyers being complicit in wrongdoing, knowingly or recklessly. Uh, or turning a blind eye, if you like, and all of those things are problematic. Uh, uh, and maybe complicity, knowing or reckless complicity in unlawful, in, in actually illegal criminal conduct sometimes. So I, 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 you know, I, I can certainly point to examples of that in the cases that we were talking about. Actually, it's not, it's not about just about whether they, if you've like taken advantage of a weaker opponent, although that might be a breach of the professional rules. They've quite often done other things which are more clearly problematic. So at least two of the examples that we've talked about, there is a reasonably strong argument, it's only an argument, that some of the lawyers may have perverted the course of justice, which is a serious criminal offence. So, you know, I think they do need to take these things more seriously, and I think we probably do have a problem. Um, but whether that's the profession or the legal system or a combination of the two, I'm not so sure about. I, I, I mean, I think I struggle with the, with the blanket nature of, 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 of the allegations as if we all sit in our offices or even at home these days and spend our own, whole days professionally enabling. And, and, and you know, self-evidently we don't. Self-evidently um, that, if, if, if it exists at all, is, is, is likely to be a very small proportion of, of, of the profession. So, in a sense, you know, to, to tar the whole profession with that is, 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 is oversimplification. And then how far is, is what the, the, the broad thrust of the sort of point to do with the fact that this is, after New York, the, the, the largest financial centre in the world? Maybe it is the largest financial centre in the world. So if, if, if lawyers are uh, acting in transactions where quite a lot of money is coming in through banks, is it not inevitable that, that lawyers are going to be involved in, to a larger degree, in those transactions than they might be in other jurisdictions? Um, and it's it's not. I mean, if you look at, at the AML um, procedures in quite a lot of other jurisdictions, it's not that we have lacked rules and and regulation for quite an extended period of time in common with most of the EU. So, you know, is it is it the entire profession here is is at its no? Is it because there is the nature of the economy in London means there's more going on than it might be in other places, possibly? Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't think anybody's saying it's the whole profession, though, are they? They're saying it's pockets or it's certain kinds of practices or it's... I mean, I think I might say that there is a general problem in terms of the profession, broadly speaking, not understanding its ethical obligations and rules and tending towards zeal rather than restraint. I think that's, that might be true at a general level. But professional enabling, I don't think we have to say it's the whole profession to say that we have a problem. I think we can say it's pockets of the profession and we have a problem. And that's where I would, that's where if, like, I would hang my hat in relation to that particular argument. Well, it might not be a million miles apart in relation no. to that, but, but, but equally, I, I just wonder whether it's a, it's a factor of the London economy rather than necessarily entirely down to, to yeah. the profession. So I was, I was going to say, uh, make that point that you know, there was a Chatham House did, did this report uh, just before Christmas and um, you know, they, they described London as being the money laundering capital of the world. And they implied that anyway. And so the others had, had said that. And then they talked about professional neighbours being you know, lawyers and state agents. And, um, and um, I mean, we've talked about the you know, they focus on the, the slap cases, but also there's been you know, only four unexplained wealth orders and, 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 and I explore why, why, why that has happened. So I agree. I mean, you know, at one end of the spectrum, you've got the big firms who are getting criticised because they might have acted for some investment banks who underwrote the, the listing by a Russian company. Um, you know, is that, is that enabling? But then at the other end of the spectrum, you know, there, is, there seems to be some suggestion that, uh, um, you know, there's, there's, there have been some sort of tactics, which, as Richard said, may, may, may border on... Um, you know, the, the legal. I mean, as you all talked to in relation to the last question and, and what was Richard was saying before, it, it, so you're making a claim, Richard, that there is excessive zeal, people are going too far. And yet most of the examples that you gave, 
were examples of where the lawyers had committed some form of illegality, right? Yeah. They'd massaged the evidence. They'd made up the evidence. Um, uh, they polished the evidence, I think is the words they used. Now, if that's right, then this is just a question of enforcement, right? Lawyers shouldn't break the law. They know that they shouldn't be able to do that. And then we just need to enforce it to make sure that they don't. And, and, we, and we solve the problem. But then there's a sense for you that, that there is a, a world, a zone in which lawyers, maybe within the law, are simply going too far. Um, and then the question becomes, how do, we, how do we stop that if that's right? And then it just seems to me that we come back to where we started out in the first question, which is about the incentives. Yeah. Right? It's all about the incentives and to, to, to ensure that lawyers act with integrity in those difficult choices when they're faced between zeal and integrity, you know, we need to get the incentives right. And the incentives are clearly not right. So I say it's partly about incentives. Um, I, 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 I think it's also about in, enforcement. I think you're right about that too, proper enforcement of a, 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 a more serious approach to uh, regulation and enforcement of ethical obligations would help quite a lot. Um, it may also be about the substance of the rules as well. So some of the, I, I tended to focus on the areas where you could show, if you like, more serious conduct, but there are areas where, so there, there is an obligation not to take unfair of, uh, advantage by reason of your position. So solicitors are not allowed to take unfair advantage of an opponent, actually, whether or not they're represented. What does that actually mean? Well, I'm not sure we really know what that means. That's quite an unclear standard, which is starting to be used in a way different from the place which it started out was, which was lawyers taking advantage of litigants in person, essentially, and that law is now seen as having a broader reach. What do we mean by independence? Lawyers are supposed to be independent, and yet they're also supposed to serve the best interests of their client. And the incentives drive a lack of independence, both, and those incentives are both cultural and economic. Um, what does independence mean? How does one manifest that? We might need to think more clearly about the structures and approaches that lead to stronger independence. Um, there are clear reporting up obligations for lawyers when they're dealing with organisational clients, for instance. They're sort of out there in the law and kind of general guidance, but there's nothing very concrete about what lawyers need to do when they're dealing with this kind of misconduct enabling or dealing with. So I think there's it's about incentives, it's about enforcement and regulation, but it also might be about substantive rules. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I was going to say, if you've, if you've ever acted in commercial litigation, probably 10, 15, 20 years ago, it, it wasn't for the faint-hearted. Daily, five or six letters going between the solicitor's practices, accusing the other of, of all manner of everything that they could think of to gain the advantage for their client. And I think, I think it, it's calmed down a bit from that, but the way in which we litigate, um, and certainly in in that dispute resolution side, and it may, may be similar in some aspects of the corporate side, is, is very aggressive. I mean, it's adversarial by definition. But I, I, you know, I often wonder whether, because that means you therefore push yourself or push your class position to the limit, because that is the nature of the process, do we end up with some of these behaviours and a culture that creates a problem where people stray over the line, to put it neutrally? Um, so it's it's a enforcement would help change the culture. Um, maybe shift in values and with that no longer being thought of as the right way to 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 undertake those processes might change change it as well. But it's um, yeah, no holds barred litigation and um, corporate transactions where nobody sleeps for five days because they want to get deals done does encourage a certain type of behavior. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I mean that, that issue around zeal um, and you know, the the sort of integrity or independence type type sort of virtues that you want lawyers or you may say that lawyers should um, adhere to versus whether they allowed to do anything to further the interest of their client provided it's not illegal. You know there, there, there was an example before the uh, sort of financial crisis of, uh, of, of of lawyers sort of advising clients on you know, tax efficiency, if you like, or tax, tax avoidance, perfectly legal, but basically um, you know, structuring around um, you know, tax rules to minimise tax for corporate, corporate clients. Um, 
And what happened in the end was the, the Inland Revenue closed that down, where the laws changed, was substance over and form law came in, and, and you couldn't do that anymore. But the question is, should, you know, should lawyers have been you know, involved in that in the first place? Should, you know, should, you know, should, should someone have said, actually, no, that's, um, you know, that's, that's going against the spirit of the rule, or, or actually you know, applying some sort of moral compass? I just don't think that's the right thing to do. So you know, do we want to move to a position where lawyers sort of um, you know, ask themselves those, those questions? As opposed to, and the research by Richard and others suggest that you know, most lawyers still um, adhere to that view, um, you know, of, of that standard conception that you know my primary interest, my primary duty is to the client, and, and they're not necessarily aware that there is this sort of public interest overlay. And if there's a um, a conflict between the duty of your client and, and the public interest duty, then you know, the, the code of practice says you know, the public interest duty prevails. But I, I just don't think necessarily. You know that, that is certainly when I was in practice. You know, I, I, I probably subscribe to that view as well. You know that, that, that you, you know you build up your your client. Mm -hmm. Go to practice. There's the public interest. The incentives. Say your client. That's the problem. Yeah. Listen. Thank you so much, uh, gentlemen, for for a really wonderful uh, conversation. Um, that that we there will be a podcast shortly after after this event. Um, so we are out of time. We have many more questions, largely focused around the cab rank rules. So that's why just to just to call, just to everyone in the audience in, on, on Zoom, I didn't pick up any more of those because I, I felt they were in the same zone as the cab rank question we had before. So thank you so much uh, for this. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you.